All right, guys. Before we jump into the part two of apocalypse proofing your feed, Tom, who I met a few years ago here, wants to share his ask me how I know story. Okay, my ask me how I know, it has to do with uh, in the garden and supplementing the soil and uh, by adding manure to it and into the soil. So one year I went to the uh, local, <clears throat> what do you call it, the, the auction house where they have cattle and all that, and they had a big pile of manure, and I got a truckload of it and spread it out. And that worked out really good. And uh, after that, about three years ago, this one friend of mine, friend, he, he said that, hey, I have a barn I need to clean out. How about I, you know, you know, scoop up a bunch of the old manure out of there and, and put it, you know, and, and bring it to you. So he brought like a 16 foot trailer of it and I, I got my tractor and unloaded it and then spread it all over the garden. And uh, so so anyway, that's not a good idea. And will somebody ask me how I know? How do you know? <laughs> Well, I'm still pulling weeds out that I've never seen before. So, and I have them all over my garden, in the garlic patch, and everywhere. So, anyway, something to remember. Yeah, it's true. One time, I I got horse manure from my neighbor, and the same thing. It took me about three years of weird weeds, and then I learned, oh, you compost that, and then you put it in the garden. Mm -hmm. So that was a good lesson. Excellent. Ask me. Okay, Nick, are you gonna are you gonna take us to the next level? We're going to the next level. Okay, online people, if you have questions, please put the first couple words <clears throat> in all caps. And I will star those and, those and try to integrate them into the Q&A session at the end. If anybody has been on Jack's wireless network before and you're on it right now, please disconnect because it's been interfering with the live stream. And after hours, he will turn on the guest network, use that network. But during sessions, it's kind of disruptive to have the internet going in and out for the live stream. So please do not use the Wi-Fi, even if you could in the past. All right, Nick, take it away. All right. So we're talking about the second phase here. Um, you know, we talked about if times get tough or even if they don't. We want to make sure we are able to feed our animals both kinds of scenarios. <clears throat> we went over when times are good, if we're on the the matrix route. We're still feeding just all the pellet feed from the, the grain elevator. It's easy, it's cheap, it's convenient, but it sets us up for disaster. The better way is to start transitioning to sustainable practices that we can feed our animals um, exclusively from our own property. That's a really important thing. This, uh, this segment, we're going to be talking about insect production, protein for birds. We're going to talk about black soldier flies, um, oops, <clears throat> earthworms, and dubia roaches and mealworms. <clears throat> so with insects for feed, the best bugs I found, my, my number one is black soldier fly. They are um, an excellent, excellent uh, source of protein and fat for your birds. They reproduce like crazy, and they automatically harvest themselves. So if you're smarter than a grub, you can get these suckers to harvest themselves into a bucket. If you have too many of them, oh no, dry them and store them for later. You can always freeze them if you want to. Earthworms. <clears throat> um, I would put earthworms as kind of my number two. Number two, because they're so simple and easy, um, and you can set them up. Uh, both black soldier fly larvae and earthworms, you could actually set up in an automated feeding type situation where you have rabbits directly over top of the bins, and, and you could have uh, some really good synergistic production right there. Earthworms, just pretty easy. Lots of information online about them. You probably already heard about them. Dubia roaches, you might not have ever heard about those unless you keep something like a bearded dragon. So the reptile enthusiasts will often raise these to feed their reptiles. Um, they breed like roaches. <clears throat> these do not fly, which is very nice, and they're very heavy-bodied, so they don't climb out of things if you have slick sides to your bins. So it, they look cool. Um, they're, uh, they're 
again, very high protein, high fat, fantastic insect for your animals. Mealworms, probably bottom of this list just because normally they're a little bit more persnickety about their feed source and environmental conditions. But they're another one that if you get good at it and you have access to some, some good feed to feed them, they can be another really good one. Um, so we're going to talk about black soldier flies. Um, we've got the adult here on the left, and we got some grubs on the right. Um, the adults, they look like those black dirt dauber wasps. They mimic them to convince other aerial predators to not eat them because they're dangerous and stingy, um, except they're not. They don't have mouth parts. They do not sting. They just look a little bit threatening. All they do is they search for a mate. They do that song and dance. They lay eggs, and then they die. That's pretty much it. Um, what we're looking for are the larvae. So we've got an adult. <clears throat> um, they only live for a week, week and a half. They just mate, lay eggs. 320 to 620 eggs from one mating. They hatch in about four days. The larval stage depends on temperature and how much food they have. They will go through that in 10 to 50 something days. Um, this is five different instars. That's just the fancy word for development phases of their life. And then the pre-pupil stage, seven to 10 days, they don't feed. What they do in this phase <clears throat> is they migrate to a dry site. They migrate away from the feed. So if you have a nice big bin with a whole bunch of food for them, all these are going to be eaten, eaten, eaten. And then when they get to this age, they say, time to get out of here. They start crawling away. You got some ramps on the side. They'll crawl around and crawl away. They'll hit the wall and they follow the wall because they're stupid. They just follow the wall and go right up the ramp and right up the ramp. And then down the little trap hole, right into a five gallon bucket that you have waiting for them. And they will harvest themselves when they are done eating. They're ready to turn into an adult. You can just take a handful of these and toss them out and they'll turn into adults and make more eggs for you and make more feed. <clears throat> Here are some pictures. This is a poured concrete bin. Very nice. You see the, uh, the ramp on the side? If they circle around, they're gonna keep circling around and hit this ramp and go right up and out. I don't like how these are on the side. We'll see a picture of them right there. I don't like how they're on the side. You can see all this. They've been climbing up this. I would probably coat this concrete in, in an epoxy paint, two-part epoxy, to get a little bit slicker so they don't climb up it. You're probably always going to have that going on, but at least if you epoxy coat it, you're not going to have nearly as much of a, a stench issue, and uh, you'll be able to handle some of that a little bit better. And I would prefer seeing these down here, um, at least at an angle or... Um, have that, that platform a little bit further out and drop those suckers straight down. You can see what they did. They just rigged up a couple pipes and the worms just crawl into those tubs and they harvest. They could the exit and, like, yep, <clears throat> they could miss the exit and keep on going. Um, right here you have, a, this is a, a commercial version and uh, I think it's injection molded or something and you can see they fall directly down. Uh, the plastic is a lot harder for them to climb, so they fall a whole lot easier in these plastic tubs. They make commercial versions of these. You can make them yourself. I have a couple more pictures here for you. Here's a commercial one. This guy's showing the ramps at the correct angle. You need to get the angle correct. We're not going to all the details. I'm just showing you what these things are so that you can start researching them and you can take that knowledge and run with it. <clears throat> So they climb up here and they fall down here and they fall down in that and they get auto harvested. That's kind of what it looks like. You've got a drainage because you need to get the liquid out. Um, and you've got ramps, you've got a harvesting port and those are the main things. You need a main body, you need ramps to get out and you need a way to harvest them. Very simple. Here's a plywood version. You could do this, you could line it in EPDM uh, pond liner, you could line it in poly plastic, you could 
use, uh, again, the two-part epoxy uh, paint that they use in uh, potable water reservoirs. Um, it, people in the aquarium trade, uh, hobby, will use that epoxy paint and they'll make plywood aquariums that'll last for 20 years. And they're watertight. And they have marine ecosystems, which are very sensitive to chemicals. So that should work just fine for some maggots, right? Um, so we got a ramp coming up here. This is just a ramp that goes straight up the side, and then there's a hole right up there. Very simple, very easy. You could set something like this up with a rabbit cage directly over top of it, and the rabbits pee and poop right in there, and these grubs eat it and go. Here's something dead, dead simple. Look at that tote. Y'all have seen those? I've done this exact same thing. It works. It's not the best, but it works. Next, we're going to talk about earthworms. Everyone knows what earthworms are, right? Anyone not know what an earthworm is? Good. We all know what earthworms are. Uh, we can buy these online. Uh, like I said, every year, the major resellers sell out. This is an opportunity. Remember how we talked about if times are tough or even if they're not, what are we always looking for? I don't want to make a system that only works or is only useful if times go completely sideways, if everything goes completely sideways, and that's what I've built my whole life around, that's stupid. Because guess what? The majority of the time, times are not going completely sideways. I want to plan for both situations, both scenarios. I want to make sure that I'm able to take care of my family if times are great and if times are bad. I can make this pay for itself. I've got a, a friend here who makes all of his hobbies pay for themselves. I love that mentality. And we can turn this, um, we can turn this right here, any of these things into a little side income. I could start this and I could get a good system established for processing earthworms. And I could hand this over to one of my kids and I could give my kid the opportunity to run with a business. I could get a website set up for him. I could handle the tax issues and all that stuff and let this kid run his own dang business. Taking care of these worms and making money. And I want to tell you, these things are not cheap. You can make some good money with this. And it's as simple as feeding them some scraps. Very, very easy. Very simple to do. I like these big worm bins like this. You want to get them up off the ground if you're in fire, what, uh, fire ant hell like we are down here? They will. Yeah. He had to buy them. How much was that? Like $60 worth of worms in that little bag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like these big bins like this. It's as simple as some plastic stapled on the sides. You could set this up and set up a nice big wide one right underneath the rabbit cage and automatically feed your worms. It, yep, it might be. <clears throat> so this is kind of what the top of it looks like. Um, what you can do is you can take all of the material from this side and move it over to the other side and put fresh material in here, and all the worms will migrate out of the earthworm castings on this side and migrate over to the fresh stuff on the new side. And that's the way you can take them and let them just do their own thing and migrate away from the toxic to the worms, earthworm castings into the fresh stuff. And that's an easy way to do it. <clears throat> We're going to talk about dubious. Most people really get freaked out about these guys. Um, I have a really amazing wife because these lived in my house, <laughs> right? In, in my walk-in closet. They were actually right next to the bed at one point, like four feet away from the bed. She's pretty amazing. Um, these are also pretty amazing. <clears throat> uh, man, look them up. Let's talk about why you might want to consider raising these 
even if times are not tough. If you can stomach the idea of dealing with these jokers, we've got pairs here. 50 pairs. 50 males and 50 females. How much? Look at this. What does this say? Email me when back in stock. They sell out. They have an installment program. Yes. <laughs> they freaking sell out. You know what it means if they're selling out? The market is not being met. You go to almost all of these online retailers for these, and they'll have some, but they'll almost always be sold out of these bigger packages. Exactly. You take these to any pet store, they'll be like, take my money. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Here we go. Ten females and four males. Ten and four. Fourteen freaking roaches for $25. Is that free shipping? I don't know. Sixty-five freaking roaches, a hundred dollars. Are you getting the picture here? Two hundred dollars for a hundred thirty dang roaches. They look very different. <clears throat> um, this is as simple as the breeding setup needs to be, as complicated as it needs to be. Some egg cartons, some roaches, something to collect the frass. A little bit of water source. It can be something as simple as a potato or some slices of orange. They love this stuff. Um, I feed monkey chow to mine. And, and you just set them up in there. You need some ventilation in the sides to get a little bit of uh, humidity out of there. And, and they just do their thing. They, they kind of breed like roaches. Mealworms. You don't let them out. Keep the lid on them. Um, if it gets too humid, they will be able to climb up the sides. Um, so what I do is I take some talcum powder, and I rub talc powder on the top four, six inches or so. And I'll try and, and keep uh, – I'll try and only use bins that are really slick. I'll use the clear ones. Um, and then I use a uh, hot glue gun and some window screen for the sides to get some ventilation. Yep. <clears throat> mealworms. Um, I'm sure everyone has, has heard about mealworms. They're uh, supposedly a really good uh, human food source. I'm, I'm not about that. Um, here are, are the, the kind of life cycles. Um, they'll, they'll pupate. They look kind of like weird aliens. And then this is what the adult looks like. It's a beetle. Okay. This is as simple as the, the setup can be. These are concrete mixing tubs. Um, you know those black mixing tubs out here that the ducks get their water from? That's what these are. It's just a rack. You've got a little bit of substrate in there, and the worms go on top. They, the, you'll put beetles in one. Um, what they'll do is they'll have a, uh, um, like a, uh, a very fine meshed hardware cloth, and they'll put all the beetles in that hardware cloth, and they'll lay it on top of the bedding, and they'll sprinkle a little bit more bedding on top, and they'll go through there, and they'll eat, and they'll lay eggs. And then you lift that screen up and shake it, and it keeps all the beetles in the screen, and you move them to the next one. And it leaves all the eggs behind. And so the, those eggs are all within a certain age range, so they all develop at the same time. You feed them out, and then when they're ready to harvest, you scoop them all out, sift them out, and use them. And it's very systematic, very easy to do. Uh, and you could start with this stuff in a shoebox under your bed. They make no smell. They're very simple and easy. <clears throat> you can feed mealworms rabbit manure. You know, we're talking about raising willow and white mulberry to feed our rabbits. And we can take what the rabbits make and feed them to mealworms. Now, you can't do that exclusively because these actually absorb quite a bit of moisture. And like I talked about with the mealworms, I said they're very temperamental. If it gets too moist and moldy, they'll die. <clears throat> so 
typically people keep them on wheat bran. I don't like the idea of being tied to a grain product because then I'm tying myself back into that system. However, that might be something to help you in the interim period. Like I said, it's all right to be using those pellets, but let's not make our whole dependence based on grain elevators. <clears throat> you say, but they're gross. We've got uh, Ramsey here. They're absolutely disgusting. I say, who cares? But did you die? And that's, that's kind of the question. Um, if we are designing something to create sustainability in our lives um, and, and the, the boogeyman that we've got to deal with is some gross bugs once a week, yeah, quit whining. Um, this guy would love for you to eat these bugs. Um, we've got a Dr. Evil superimposed over here. We got a, a nice little shish kebab of mealworms, I think. Mealworm kebabs. Um, how about no? <laughs> um, that's what I say. Um, instead, let's do this. We can raise these insects, which, I mean, they're pretty good. They're pretty good for chickens. And we can turn those into that. So we can eat those insects. We can just do it this way. I like this way better. All right. So we're going to talk about storage a little bit. I'm trying to get through this fast enough. I can have a nice amount of Q&A time. Um, <clears throat> so storage. Um, we touched on pellets a little bit. Um, we touched on drying the stuff a little bit. Um, and we talked about fermentation. Um, the, the questions are always, you know, well, how much, you know, how many, how many fodder trees do I need? They want a, a recipe for success. Um, life often just doesn't work that way. We can't just, I can't, I wish I could just give you, here's the number, start with this. And that'll be good for you. Everyone's taking pictures because they think these are the recipes. These aren't the recipes. I just made stuff up. <laughs> I did, I did put 20%, 20%, 20% white mulberry because we know that's about the upper limit that we can push to chickens. It's a uh, it's little bit more than that. We can, we can put to Muscovies and it's a lot more than that with um, geese. We can feed geese pretty much exclusively off of this fodder. That's one of the nice things about geese. Um, <clears throat> but talking about chickens and quail, we need to keep that number down. So, I mean, it's split it up. We got 50% insects, 60% insects, 30%. Um, we got some grains over here, carb crops. So, I mean, we could, if we're thinking about how can I make this sustainable? How can I make this productive on a small scale? Um, <clears throat> you could be growing some pumpkin. You could be growing some winter squash. You could be growing sugar beets. Uh, you could be growing all kinds of carbohydrate crops that you could grow on a smaller scale or even a, a large scale, harvest that stuff, put it through a hammer mill, dry it, whatever you have to do to process it, and you can combine it with your insects and some of your fodder leaves. And we could either just rough grind the loose feed to feed our birds, or we can turn it into pellet. <clears throat> But the, the recipe is really going to be dependent upon what you have to put into it. And that's, that's one of those things. I can't just give you a pat answer. But these are some general uh, ratios that would probably work in most situations. So, to pelletize or not. Um, if you decide, yes, I really like that idea, I'm going to do that. Uh, we get a longer shelf life out of... The product because we reduce the oxidization oxidation um uh, it's easier if we are putting those pellets in something like a hopper feeder to dispense it to our animals or if we have some kind of a feeding system we were on pellets already in our whole system 
All of our infrastructure is designed around feeding pellets, for instance. Well, it just might make sense that if we are a, a small scale production, that if we add a little bit more infrastructure in the term, in the form of the capacity to make our own feed pellets, then we could actually divorce ourselves from dependence on the feed store by growing our own stuff. Again, we're talking about, does this work if everything goes sideways? And if you have that equipment, you can do it. Does it make sense if everything is functional and it's cheap to feed the normal feed? It might not. You have to do your own factoring in. You have to crunch the numbers yourself. But what if you were growing white mulberry, for instance, and you had some mealworms or dubia roaches? You probably want to stay away from the roaches because most of the people I'm about to talk about would be really grossed out at that. But maybe you're growing some other insect and, and you're selling some premium beyond organic, sustainably sourced, harvested and ethically grown chicken treats to the yuppie crazy chicken lady. And she's going to feed $20 a pound, $50 a pound chicken treats to Henrietta. Well, it might make sense to invest in a pelletizer because if times are good, you can sell these things to crazy chicken ladies. That's a business you could, you could take on. You can, there, is a, there is a market for small-scale feed, and, and that's 4700 bucks for both of those machines. I mean, you can go crazy and, and spend eighteen grand on one of these, a bigger pelletizer, or you could go pretty small scale and have a PTO driven. And the, uh, I think the, the smallest version of this I saw with a hammer mill and pelletizer was around 2,300 bucks. I know people personally that do not raise livestock commercially. It's just a hobby and they'll spend 2,300 bucks a couple times a month or once a month to go to the feed store. That's pretty, pretty significant. Um, so if you decide, you know what, I'm going to stay away from that. I don't want to pelletize. Well, it's less equipment. That's fine. Less heat. Less heat means less nutrient degradation. Um, so short term, we're going to have higher nutrient content in our feed, which is good. It also means we're going to have uh, uh, lower nutrient content long term. We might have some moisture issues we have to think about for storing this stuff if we grind it. Um, but if you harvest it and, and dry it and preserve it whole and, and hold that over until you need it and then grind it, then you can get some longer term storage out of it. <clears throat> um, and something as simple as a low tech grinder will work. And you can get these, uh, these cheap corn grinders um, PTO driven or gas or diesel or electric powered, um, cheap corn grinders for, for very little, just a few hundred bucks. Um, <clears throat> does anyone want me to go over this again, more in depth or did we get it? We good more in depth than before. Depth than before? Is that what you mean? Yes. I've, I've pretty much covered this. I think Jack has another presentation. If anyone would like to cover this, because I do want to have enough time for uh, a little bit more Q&A, yeah, we can do a work-in session. Um, so, final thoughts. <clears throat> if we use these fodder trees as that foundation, because everything starts from there. Remember, there's our fodder trees. That's our foundation. We can feed our ruminants, rabbits, sheep, goats, cattle, um, anything that'll eat those leaves can go in place of this. And most likely the yield from this can go to feed something like this. If we, let's say, let's say you don't eat rabbits. You don't want rabbits. I don't want to eat rabbits. Why would I do this? I can take these rabbits 
and I can sell them for a profit. I can sell them to people that want to raise rabbits. And I can keep all of the manure, right? I could sell that manure. People buy that stuff. You can literally find this stuff in gallon bags on Amazon and eBay. And they're buying it like crazy, okay? There's, there are reasons why you want to do this stuff, even if you're not going to eat them. Do not look at this and say, well, I don't want rabbits. I don't want to eat them. Um, th this doesn't work for me. Look at the possibilities. The earthworms. <clears throat> um, switch that out for black soldier flies. You know, black soldier flies eat meat, dead stuff. If you don't want the rabbits and you can't sell them, you know what we could do with the rabbits? <laughs> we could kill the rabbit and throw it in the black soldier fly bin and turn it into chicken food. I raise rabbits to feed my dogs. It's better dog food. I have very healthy, very happy dogs, and they get rabbits. Break the neck, throw the whole rabbit to them, and they're happy and healthy. Okay? So I can have, I can turn fodder trees into a 24-7, 365 security detail that patrols my property and will die to protect my wife and children all because I have fodder trees. And that security detail is pretty much free because I'm feeding fodder leaves to the rabbits, feeding the rabbits to the dogs, okay? We're thinking outside of the normal Western paradigm here. <clears throat> um, that allows us to divorce ourselves from dependence on outside sources. I am not saying, I'm not advocating for everyone becoming insular and being separated from society and saying, I'm going to be 100% self-sufficient and independent and I get to just unplug completely and shut my, my gates and put up concrete walls around my property and I'm going to handle everything myself. I'm not, don't do that. That's crazy. What I am saying is if we start changing our thinking from feeding pellets, to how can I meet the needs for my animals, then we will be able to shift and adjust to when times get tough, or even if they don't. We can build resiliency, and we can snowball wealth. We can continually build and build and build to the point where we must export it. You know what it's called when you're exporting these, these, yes, yeah, profit. It will literally, if you set something up like this, you will get to the point where you must profit or else you will poison your ecosystem because too much rabbit manure is not a good thing. You will have a point where you must absolutely do that. That is an amazing, amazing system. <clears throat> we talked about silage. Um, does anyone have questions on fermenting these leaves for silage? I'm just kind of rolling this straight into the Q&A right here. Got some questions on fermenting. You mentioned Lactobacillus bacteria and but doing this anaerobically. Does the Lactobacillus work both aerobically and anaerobically? Yes. Okay. It is. It's, it's more of an anaerobic, but yes, it works as both. So when you were, I think you mentioned this briefly, but you said you could store this in like 55 gallon drums. Yes. Um, how, how tight does this seal have to be? Like I have the plastic, I have a bunch of plastic 55 gallon drums. The lid doesn't really come off They're, They have the two spouts are for liquid primarily. Yep. Um, if I cut one of those off, like how secure does that top have to be to keep them dry? And, and Great question. So what I would suggest is you put a liner in there, um, a bag liner that extends a lot higher up. You put that in there, you fill it up, you compact it, you get it as full as you can. And then when you have it compacted, you stand on it, you close the, close the bag, kind of give it a twist. Don't twist it tight so air can get back out of it. And then you push down on it, stand on it, whatever you got to do to kind of squeeze more air out of it. And you get that packed down as much as you can. And you give that a good hard twist, put a little bit of duct tape around it or tie a string around it fold it over, tie a string on that or duct tape that, put your 
put your date on that so you know exactly when that was made and when you can start using it. And then what you can do is when you open that up, you pull out of it and then you reseal it. And how long does that store for? Um, I mean, I've, I've heard reports of this stuff staying good for a couple of years. Stored airtight. Do we have one from online? Do you want to ask one? I have two old bathtubs that I will set up for summertime. Any ideas on insulating them for negative 20 degree winters? Currently thinking about just bringing the red wigglers into the house. And I don't know if they meant F or C on that temperature. <clears throat> um, either way, yeah, you're going to need to bring those worms inside. That'll They'll just turn into an ice cube block. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd bring those red wigglers in, set up a... a you know, double, triple layer, um, tote, uh, set up for your worms. So you can keep migrating them up. That's one of the best ways you have holes, uh, drilled in the bottom of each of those totes and you start them in the bottom. And when it fills up enough that another tote can sit on top of it, then you set it down there and you put a little bit more bedding in there and more food. They migrate up through the holes into the new bedding and they start eating that stuff and they keep eating it and keeping it. They move away from the worm castings in the bottom and they keep migrating up and up. I do that inside. You can do that in a closet. Um, you can do that in a heated garage. You just have to protect them from, uh, from freezing temps. Hi, I've got, I've got two um, just briefly on the fermented silage. Do you have to add a starter of some sort to that? No. Or are you just bucket? You don't have to add a starter. Go. They are completely covered in, in the kind of bacteria that you need, I would not worry about it in the awesome. least. And if you could just briefly touch on um, the dog food and, and kind of the process of yeah. going about feeding the dogs with the rabbits and the chickens and stuff. Yep. Um, so if you have dogs that are not used to eating like that, then you're going to have to transition them. Um, Joe was, uh, Joe, right? Joel, Joel um, was talking about uh, dog training and he used a lot of examples of incremental shift where you incrementally change the mindset, you incrementally train. You don't just expect a dog to do this elaborate set of, of um, movements and routines and do all these cool things. You go one step at a time. You go one step and you go to the next step and you go to the next step, make it very simple. And so very simply, does anyone have a dog that would pass up table scraps? Not a single... Oh, one, one dog that would pass up table scraps. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, most of them will not pass up a table scrap. So you could take the rabbit, you could harvest it, clean it just like normal, cook it part way, put some seasoning on it, cook it half way, feed that to them. And they get the taste for it. Hey man, this is good stuff. And then the next time you cook it, you put the seasonings on it and you just sear it. It's mostly raw. Toss that to them. Mmm, yummy and crunchy. There's all kinds of good stuff in here. The next time you do it, you skin it. You don't gut it. You put some seasonings on it. and Maybe you just try it like that. Maybe you have to put a little bit of a sear on it. The, the idea is you want them to associate that as yummy food. Um, that's what I did. It took me about three different steps. Um, I, I just skinned the rabbit and put a sear and a little bit of garlic salt on it. And it tasted good. Bones, yes, everything. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, so I transitioned them like that, step by step. If they wouldn't eat it, I'd go back to a previous step so they would eat it. Once they were used to it, it got to the point where um, all I had to do was I took the rabbit out of the cage, set it on the ground, put the tool handle across its neck, Lift it up very sharply and quick, snap the neck, cervical dislocation, the rabbit's dead. The dogs would line up on the other side of the fence. I would toss the rabbit, the first rabbit, to the pack leader. That alpha dog got the first rabbit, and the rest would just wait. They'd wait for their rabbit, and the next one would get his rabbit, and the next one would get her rabbit, and the next one would get her rabbit. And they would all take their rabbits off to their corners, and they'd lay down, and they'd eat the guts first, or maybe the head, or maybe both. And then they'd bury it, 
and they'd let it season and get all delicious. Mm, it would just smell so good to those dogs. Um, and, and they'd eat on that for two or three days. And then I would let them fast for a day. Um, so if they finished it off on day two, they didn't get any food on day three. They had a hopper feeder, but they weren't interested in that nasty kibble dog food stuff for the, buy from the store because they get good stuff, right? Um, and then uh, day four, they might get a chicken leg quarter because I figured out chicken leg quarters, bought in 10-pound sacks, not good food, but I could have a freezer full of this stuff for 50 cents a pound. Push comes to shove, I got a freezer full of chicken, right? Worst case scenario, I got chicken. Um, so I'd feed that to them. Um, so yeah, hair, fur, bones, everything. Just leave it alone. They're, they're literally designed to eat that stuff. Um, and I, I've never had a single problem with it. Um, do not feed them the cooked bones um, when, when you cook those bones, there's something that happens chemically. Um, the bones kind of crystallize a bit and they get very splintery, but I, I, you can go home today or after this workshop, don't go home today. we got fun stuff to do. Um, you can take a chicken bone and set it on a, a cutting board and just smack it with a ha hammer. It's not going to splinter into a thousand pieces. It's just going to kind of crumble or smush. Um, and that's what happens. Those dogs will just chew right through that. It's no problem. The raw bones. Raising black soldier fly, is it only a warm weather sport? Can you do any, I mean, what, what do you, what can you do year round if you have, you know, Tennessee weather or. Yeah. Um, so they are, they are warm weather insects. Um, if you're going to raise them in a more Northern climate, you might want to consider season extension with a greenhouse or hoop house, maybe some active heating. Um, but otherwise what you can do is just set up lots of bins, take advantage of the warm weather, put tons of, tons of feed to them and process a whole bunch of feed during the summer. You can take those, uh, those, those larvae, you can put them in a solar dehydrator, a solar oven, and just cook dry them. And you can take that and dump those into bins or you can pulverize it and pelletize it and just use that however you need to. They, they just show up. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had to buy them. Um, if, yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like disgusting crawling manna from heaven or hell. Um, the, the, the question, the answer to how do you get them started? Um, so I was really big into home brewing years ago and I found them just growing in a mash tun that I just didn't clean out quick enough. All you have to do is get some feed, some laying pellets, some cracked corn, anything like that, get it wet, set it in a tub in the shade and wait a couple weeks and they're going to be crawling all through it. And you just take those, dump them in your bin and you're good to go. Okay. Let's take one from online hatch. Josh says, can, can a I... feed pelletizer be used to make Traeger smoke pellets for another side hustle? Absolutely. Um, a lot of those uh, feed pelletizers, will have the capacity to pelletize wood. Like that's what most of these are made for. The more heavy duty ones will do wood and then all of the feed. Uh, the light duty ones will only do feed because they handle uh, uh, crumblier, less, uh, less dense feedstock material. But absolutely, you could take, uh, you, could, you could make mulberry uh, uh, Traeger pellets and <laughs> apple Traeger pellets, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, getting started with mealworms and quail, what's the best way? Because will those little guys even eat a mealworm? Absolutely. They'll eat a mealworm. Um, if, I, if I were raising insects, I would go more um, towards the, the black soldier fly larva for the quail because they harvest themselves. Um, uh, David, do they, do they eat them whole? Because I don't raise quail. Yep. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely the. Yeah, mealworms are a lot of work. Um, yeah. Mealworms were at the bottom of my list because of the labor and the feed stock inputs. They're normally just, in my opinion, they're not worth it. Um, nice. Nice. brainstorm a lot he's by far the expert black soldier flies i think will out compost almost anything else which is commercially available they will i do mixed beds with earthworms on bottom and black soldier fly on top no because you have but you have to let those black soldier flies freeze and die because they will out compete earthworms and your earthworms will starve to death that's how good of composters they are yeah but awesome Somebody want to know if it's unhealthy to feed black soldier flies to quail. After the, made after the quail poop. soldier flies have uh, <laughs> been raised on the quail stuff, no, I don't think it'd be a problem at all. I, 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 David's done it for generations. I say go with it. Is there anything that you can't use, any leafy green matter you can't use for making silage, silage? And how – so I, 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 uh, Bermuda grass in St. Augustine specifically, I mow lawns for a living, so I get bags of it. Yep. And then I twist it up and then I leave it in the sun and then it smells horrible. I'm assuming it's because I get too much oxygen in there. <clears throat> so I need to make sure that I've got bags that are closed and I don't have any oxygen in there. Twist it up a little bit tighter, probably throw it in the shade. But is can I feed those grass clippings? Am I am I like this close to making a useful animal feed product or probably um, there's there's a product called haylage. They will cut the hay. They'll bale it green and wet. And they will wrap it in that plastic film. You've seen those giant uh, uh, marsh marshmallows in, in fields and, and giant uh, white uh, caterpillars. Um, that's that's haylage. Um, I've never made haylage with with grass clippings. I hate mowing lawns, so I, I don't do it. I don't have one. Um, I would much rather uh, have four legged off road automated um lawn trimmers go do that for me and and make me meat so i don't know um that's that's a good question i don't know hey so uh if we're going back to the chart that had the flow and how everything moves through yep is it the case that each one of those steps in the process produces uh, a multiplicity and abundance for each downstream process in it Yes. Uh, or is there any point in that where there's an additional input that's required? For example, you emphasize the importance of mulching, watering, and fertilizing on the fodder tree at the beginning of the process. Right. If your end game were chickens, would they produce enough manure to fully satisfy like the fertilizing requirement on the fodder tree? Yes. The second go around. So that's how it all works. And, yes. And that's where you're saying that there's the abundance, the profit Correct. component. Okay. Absolutely. I to make sure I understood that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure there are some some small things like minerals for the rabbits, but if you get enough um, of your soil remineralized, that's another thing I really talk to people about. I really encourage you look into. I didn't have time to cover it uh, today, but you get your uh, your minerals in balance in this whole system, then you can have have a a tremendous amount of independence. Um, from up uh, from outside inputs. I mean, you'll always have have water. Um, so you know, you'll you'll be pumping water, but things like that are are kind of incidentals. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Okay, K Bonk wants to know: Ab Can you add humanure to this absolutely, process? Absolutely. Um, I would not at all hesitate to use humanure on these fodder trees all day long. So um, we get the uh, black soldier fly manna from heaven quite heavily every year with the uh, cleaning the kennels. Yes. So we pick up the poop, we put it in buckets and put a lid on it. Uh, if the lids are on properly, it minimizes it there, but there's still the, the yep. residue that gets washed into the rocks. And uh, so we set up these big fly catchers to catch the, the black soldier flies. And of course they fill up with the, the maggots as well. Yep. So 
one of my questions, I well, first, can I take that and essentially bake it down, dehydrate it, and then feed it through the year? Or is there anything in those fly catchers that would be damaging to the chickens? Um, I don't. So I don't know what your fly catchers are set up like. Um, the adult flies are, I would not call them devoid of nutrition, but they are because they don't eat. They are literally just burning through every amount of feed value that they have um, from before they even turn into an adult because they're pupating. So they're like this, this gooey um, food packet. I mean, it's like a, it's like a hot pocket. Um, there it's just as disgusting. Um, <laughs> and, and as soon as it starts pupating, it's using up that energy. And then as it's an, an adult, it's burning up that energy, looking for a mate and trying to lay eggs. So I would say that the adult stuff is probably low nutrient. Um, instead, what you should consider doing is setting up manure processing with black soldier fly bins and harvest that stuff. And then you use the, the leftover sludge. You clean that out. You put it on your fodder trees. And then you raise your fodder trees to raise rabbits and, and maybe geese and use those to feed your dogs. And then what you'll end up with is because we're adding into this, this cyclic recycling, we've got this recycling thing, we're adding into that solar inputs. And we're adding into that, uh, the plants are capturing CO2 to make matter. They're converting that gas into a solid in the form of carbohydrates and, and other compounds. So we're actually increasing the amount of matter that is contained within our control. And that matter is normally good, healthy soil, which will grow stuff, which we can then turn into food. So, so a perfect follow-on question to that then with, if I collected, well, we're already collecting the dog poop and that's usually yep. what's drawing them into that yep. location. If we set up the, um, the collection thing with the, where they come in there and they lay the, the yep. eggs there, can I set that up inside a chicken run so that with like a, a hardware cloth on top, right? Just lift it up, put the, the dog poop in there, drop yep. it down. The flies come in and then as they come out, they just. They will auto harvest out. You could actually just set the, the harvesting tube to drop into a pan where the chickens can get to it and they will, they'll hammer it. it doesn't hurt the Correct. Cause there's no poop. It's just, it's just, okay, it's just the insect at that point. Uh, I have, let's say, a giant pile of cut mulberry, white mulberry. I'm ready to process it into silage. Home grind, grinding options for, or chaff grinder, do you have a recommendation of the equipment to use? Um, people have used anything from a, a leaf grinder, uh, a leaf shredder, uh, just like the string trimmer type leaf shredders um, that, you know, you use the stupid look like pan things to grab the leaves and get those evil leaves off of your nice, pretty suburban lawn. And you dump it through this little leaf shredder that puts it right into a bag so you can give it to the trash man to put in a landfill. Instead of using one of those for that, you can just take the branch and just stick it down in there and pull it out and it'll strip all the leaves off of it. So something as simple as that up to, you know, a gas powered um, uh, wood chipper shredder, that'll work too. And then, I mean, there's, it just keeps going up in, in power and in price. Um, y yes. Um, any, anything really much larger than, than like a, a permanent marker is, is kind of getting too much. They're, they're not going to eat it if it's too woody. They'll just kind of eat around it and you'll just end up with wood chips left over. But if you're, if you're putting it through a silage process, um, I would just I would just either strip the leaves off if you have really big material. That first cut is going to be bigger material. Um, subsequent cuts will be small, much smaller, and you can just shred the whole thing, stalk and all. Yeah. Okay. Will store bought sunflower seeds sprout to feed chickens? Thank yes. You it, in advance. Yep. It it, it absolutely unless will. they did something horrible to them. Yep. Well, you know what? If they're roasted, they won't. There you you go. know, like black oil sunflower seeds at the feed store is different than in right. the bag with salt. Yeah, I don't yeah. buy the the so bird seed things. yes, food seed, bird seed no. yes. The yeah. the little packets no. Yeah, unless okay. they're raw, then they probably will. Then they might. 
Okay. I think that's all the questions. Do we have anything else Excellent. online? All right. Well, Nick, thank you so much for jazz hands. Thank you so much for this. I'm sure if you have a lot more detailed questions you want to throw at Nick, he's here. He's really good at giving his time to questions about this. And he knows so much about many things is like the soil mineralization. That would yep, be a good yep. thing to talk to Nick. He knows where to get your test and, and is a pretty good advisor for what to do when you get your test and don't know how to read it, for example. Uh, we are flowing into the evening time now. Dinner's at 7, I believe, right, Dorothy? Dinner's at 6.30. Oh, okay. That's fine. You, you want to? Yeah. Okay. We're ready. We're almost ready. Okay. Well, we actually have sessions probably until 6.30 with the the breakout sessions. So from here, guys, the garage becomes a bar. 